In 2014, five Finnish men entered the Plura cave system located in the Plurdalen Valley, Norway. Over the course of several horrifying hours, only three of the five men resurfaced. The two remaining were left behind to fight for their lives in the dark underwater cave, descending to a depth of 130 meters. They had no idea of the deadly danger waiting inside. Here at the Faculty of Truth, we will break down what happened on that tragic day known as the Plura Cave Diving Tragedy. Plura Grotta, the deepest cave system in Rana, Norway, and Northern Europe, attracts cave divers who love exploring. Rana is a popular destination for these divers, but not all underwater routes are safe and well explored. Few accidents have happened in Plura, and though it's risky, it's still accessible year round. The water is clear, but it gets super cold in the Norwegian winters. The surface of Lake Plura even freezes over. Despite these challenges, Plura Grotta is open for divers who want to take on the cold waters and discover its mysteries. Tourists love Plura Grotta because of its colorful caves. Beginners often dive in the shallower cave areas to enjoy cave fauna and formations. Those who are well-trained and curious might want to keep going and explore more of the narrow cave system. Explorers who decide to move ahead encounter really tight, narrow spaces, freezing water, and super dark conditions. Divers have to be careful because there are many dead-end passages that might lead to the unknown, not to mention the irregular cave surface that might cause divers to get stuck in it. Once they go through an underground water pocket called a sump, they eventually reach the cave of Steinugelflage. Finally, about 90 meters above the cave's curved ceiling is the way out, a crack in the collapsed side of a hill. Back on February 6, 2014, two Finnish divers carved a triangular hole in the ice covering Lake Plura and slipped into the water. Wrapped up in waterproof dry suits and carrying hefty diving gear, they swiftly descended into the dark water. After two hours, when the sediment stirred by the first divers had settled, three more men joined their friends. The destination for all five was Steinugel Flage. Before embarking on this adventure, the Finnish men gathered at the Ojamo mine, west of Helsinki, to establish a plan. They agreed that there wouldn't be a designated leader, but Patrick Gronkvist, part of the trio that discovered the passage the year before, took the lead. He was confident that the dive would go as smoothly as last time. His close friend, Jerry Huoterinen, accompanied him on the journey, trusting in Patrick's past experience to ensure their safety. This specific journey was testing the limits of an already dangerous sport. Typically, amateur divers limit themselves to half-hour to an hour dives at a depth of only 30 meters. However, this expedition, aided by underwater scooters, extended to about five hours, reaching depths beyond 130 meters. The further the divers explored, the riskier the navigation became. The water got colder and the tunnels became even narrower. A small injury from the sharp rocks could turn fatal in these deep and challenging conditions. Spending an extended period at this depth increases the risk of equipment failure or a condition known as hypercapnia, which is carbon dioxide poisoning. Cave divers rely on rebreathers, a tool that absorbs the carbon dioxide they breathe out. It's crucial for divers to maintain a regulated and steady breathing pattern. Failure to do so could overload the rebreather with carbon dioxide, putting the diver in a risky situation. Even a mild case of hypercapnia, which is carbon dioxide poisoning, can be dangerous, leading to confusion and disorientation for divers. In the dark caves, such a situation can result in serious consequences. About an hour into the dive, Patrick Gronkvist and Jari Hutarinen had navigated through the deepest section of the system, approximately 110 meters lower than the cave entrance. At this moment, Patrick noticed that his friend was missing. Upon returning, he discovered Jari in a narrow part of the cave, entangled by a cord connected to his gear. 
It is believed that Yari turned into a wrong passage with no way forward. Upon realizing his mistake, he began pushing himself out but became entangled by a cord connected to his gear. Using a flashlight to signal distress to Patrick, Yari was showing signs of panic, putting him at risk of hypercapnia. Patrick handed his friend a gas cylinder to lessen the influx of carbon dioxide into his system. However, during mouthpiece switch, the worst occurred. Jari Huataranen began gasping underwater, inhaling water into his lungs. Patrick, in utter horror, observed his friend desperately trying to breathe before falling still. He witnessed his friends drowning right before his eyes. Out of fear for his own life, Gronkvist intentionally slowed his breathing. Recognizing that grieving for his friend could expose him to hypercapnia, Patrick knew he had to be cautious. Despite attempting to free Jari without success, Patrick had no option but to proceed to Steinugelflage as initially planned. Gronkvist encountered another life-threatening challenge on his way to the surface. Decompression sickness, also known as the bends, happens when a person ascends too quickly after deep sea diving, causing nitrogen bubbles to form in the bloodstream. Symptoms include pain, dizziness, fatigue, and in severe cases, neurological or cardiovascular issues. Since Gronkvist spent an extra half hour at 110 meters, he now faced hours of making additional stops before safely surfacing to lessen decompression symptoms. The thought of resurfacing, especially without Jari's body, filled Patrick with dread. Adding to the tension, he was aware that the second team would soon arrive, encountering the scene themselves. Vesa Rantanen, leading the second team, was the first to come across Yari Huotarinen's body. Faced with a crucial decision, Vesa had to choose between turning back or navigating past the drowned diver. Despite choosing to press forward, he lost an additional 15 minutes navigating around the body, resulting in an additional a few hours of required decompression time before surfacing. Full of terror, he hastened to the surface, worsening the symptoms of decompression sickness. Shortly after emerging, he began to feel pain in his knees and elbows. The pain intensified in the hours that followed. The fourth diver after Vesa was Jari Usimaki that faced his own challenges. According to the Norwegian police, Usimaki panicked upon finding the body, leading to an overload of his rebreather with carbon dioxide. He decided to turn back, but eventually, due to an overloaded rebreather, couldn't breathe and drowned just 20 meters away from Huotarinen. The fifth and final diver, Kai Kankinen, tried to help Jari without success. Unlike Visa, Kai chose not to continue to Steinugelflage. Instead, he retraced his route, making the arduous journey back to their starting point. Kankanen surfaced in the early hours of the night, almost 11 hours after beginning the dive. Breaking through a thin layer of ice, he climbed out of the water upon reaching the surface of Plura. All three survivors ended up in the hospital with decompression sickness. The local authorities collected statements from each diver and initiated a rescue plan, which, as it turned out, was very complicated. Two weeks later, a rescue diver from the United Kingdom named Rick Stanton and two other divers prepared for a rescue mission. It became evident to the three men that Yari Huotarinen could not be readily freed from the Steinugel Flaget side of the tunnel, and his body was blocking access to Jari Usimaki. For a moment, the divers considered returning to their point of origin and attempting to dive backward but it proved to be far more dangerous. The recovery was too risky, and so the Norwegian police called it off. At this stage, Patrick Gronquist made a promise to Jari Huotarinen's wife. He assured the grieving widow that he would find a solution to recover the men to the surface. In the world of diving, even in death, the unspoken rule is that no diver is left behind, and Gronquist was determined to honor that commitment. It didn't take Patrick long to realize that his friends had the same plan in mind. They were all anticipating the right time. The three survivors and another diver named Pakarinen were gearing up for the second recovery mission. The entire operation had been carefully plotted in secrecy from authorities. The men were aware that seeking permission from the Norwegian police would likely be denied. 
These divers had a unique advantage over the previous British rescue team. All four of them had completed the dive before and were confident they could reach their friends' bodies from the pleura side. The only thing that terrified them was the prospect of seeing their friends' bodies in the dark water. It took a few weeks for Patrick and his companions to prepare, both physically and emotionally. They aimed to avoid underwater panic and prevent another tragedy. On March 22, 2014, a team of 27 divers gathered at Plura. Two support teams would operate in the shallower cave areas, while Gronkvist, Pakarinen, and Konkinen would plunge into the depths to recover the bodies. Visa Rantanen, recovering from a spinal injury due to decompression sickness, took on the role of surface manager. After descending about 85 meters, Kankanen returned. Looking upset, he explained that he slept badly and is simply not in the right frame of mind for the operation. Pakarinen and Gronkvist continued the descent alone. They passed the floating body of Jari Usimaki. Then, just 20 meters or so further on, they encounter Yari Huotorinen, exactly as Gronkvist had left him seven weeks earlier. Cutting his equipment away, they manage to release the bodies and negotiate them through the narrow part of the cave. Then Gronkvist steers a dive scooter towards the surface, towing the bodies one by one, while Pakarinen follows to help maneuver them. Eventually, the retrieval team successfully recovered the bodies of Yari Usimaki and Jari Huotarinen. However, the Norwegian authorities pointed out rule violations during the operation. In the months that followed, memorial services were conducted for both men, providing the three surviving divers the chance to mourn their losses appropriately.